us keeping Pat Tillman's true history alive with the American people. Um, Mrs. Mary Tillman, Pat's mother, contacted me about eight months ago and thank you and I, David, profusely for telling the truth about how her son, Pat Tillman, was murdered. Uh, he was murdered with a SA-80 bullpup uh, rifle, that's a British rifle, uh, but no, the Brits uh, may have pulled the trigger, but it had to be the 23 star fraggers that have kept the truth from surfacing. Uh, but this car is more powerful than a bunch of army generals that probably wear mantle pants when they get together to play strip poker or whatever they do. They certainly don't take care of the enlisted forces as their uh, oath of office uh, demands that they do. Uh, just so no, nobody, let's see, Bluebeam says, sweet ride. Okay, let me just talk about the car. Uh, and I don't take any pride or ego in this car, and that's why Jack Mack, as long as we have Plum City car shows and Jack Mack wants to come here, it's his car. Uh, and if you think that's uh, uh, easily done, it really isn't, because every other week of the year, that car is driven by my 20-year-old daughter, Katie, and... Uh, I don't know what she'll drive this year. Last year she drove the 66 Black Lincoln. Uh, and the reason she drives that is she has a disabled friend who can get into the Lincoln a lot easier than she can get into some of these oddball cars. Uh, and uh, when, when my daughter and her disabled friend uh, drive the Black Lincoln, they dress up like uh, uh, Jake and Elrod, the Blues Brothers. And of course, that's pretty funny because these are females looking like Blues Brothers. So enough about the, the car show. Uh, this 1940 Studebaker has a Chrysler 413. Chrysler 413s have an interesting place in automotive history in that the CEO have put everything on the back burner and they deliver a street engine that will beat anything General Motors or Ford puts on the street. Uh, and that engine became the 413. And you can't make this stuff up. Uh, the team of engineers that developed the 413 were collectively called the Ram Chargers. And for some of you who were alive in the 70s, uh, there was a Dodge Ram Charger, which was a four-wheel drive sport utility type big thing that rivaled the uh, Chevy and the Bronco. I forgot the Chevy name. That's uh, that four-wheel drive short Chevy. But enough about cars, David. Um, I just want to finish off the car bit with the uh, suggestion that we've got seven more cars to find drivers for. And the only preference will be that um, whoever appeared at Plum City Plunge last year will get to pick a car. And then the new people this year uh, can either ride in a car with one of last year's drivers or they can drive one of the leftover cars. And uh, a couple of those leftover cars are quite, no, there's no money changing hands here. Uh, Thank you for putting up, oh, that's David Hawkins put up the SOP Mod M4. Uh, that's the weapon that killed Pat Tillman. And uh, they put three rounds through the size of a quarter in his uh, forehead. And the exit, well, where the lead exited, there wasn't much left. And uh, some people think I have a sense of humor. Well, my humor stops when I think of any commissioned officer of any service not doing everything within his human and physical capability in providing for the enlisted forces in his charge. Uh, I want to give a little bit of a military lesson to some people. Um, captains occur in all the branches. There's Coast Guard captains, which are 06s. There's Navy captains, which are 06s. There's Army, Air Force, and Marine captains, which are 03s. But only one of those five services identify captain is the first word. There's two more words that follow captain if the captain leads his enlisted personnel. And just to get this out so David can come back and talk about something less serious than upholding oaths. Uh, when a captain is in the Marine Corps, he is called, or she is called, a captain of Marines. Uh, maybe on my headstone, somebody will remind my family to say something like, here lies a captain of Marines. I can't think of a greater thing. Some people don't like special forces. Some people don't like the military. 
Well, fortunately, the Special Forces, the military, and the Marines are here to ensure you can say those words safely. Uh, right now, one of the projects Able to Asia is working on night and day is domestic tranquility. And if you think that's anything new, just do the standard Able to Asia Google pattern, which is put in chips plus Hamish plus IOC plus pastel plus domestic tranquility. And you'll see that we've been charging ourselves with this obligation going back to 2008. And um, that's quite a telling collage that uh, Craig put together relating to Pat Tillman. And you can see that the level of sophistication of the man in the middle attack on American military communications, it has to be done and executed and coordinated by an ally or a perceived ally. So the tragedy is, quite obviously, the United Kingdom Ministry of Defense has been targeted, just like the Department of Defense in the United States, for these attacks. So in their wisdom, and I'm quite sure that a significant number of the senior officers in the United Kingdom Ministry of Defense Armed Forces have been entrapped and compromised at these Carlson wagon lit travel uh, honeypot hotels with children. Unfortunately for those people, they handed off the operation of the Skynet military communication systems to Circuit. And unbelievably, or perhaps it's not so unbelievable, Serco is under investigation by the United Kingdom Serious Fraud Office for its tagging of prisoners electronically with Wi-Fi devices and probably with chips subcutaneously, where the prisoners are dead, back in jail, or overseas. Serco in the United States has been given the contract, presumably by someone who's familiar with the discipline of patent law, and that has to be Hillary Clinton. The British company Serco has been given the contract to operate the United States Patent Office. Now, we forget our history at our peril. In 1812, the British burnt Washington to the ground, and they left one building standing. Office. And that was the patent office. Me too. And then in 1833, the British burnt the United States Patent Office and stole 10,000 patents and drawings and models from the patent office and took them back to London. So to all intents and purposes, the administration of the United States patent system has been in the hands of the city livery companies who are awarded these patents that have been confiscated from the Americans since the early 1800s. That's why Hillary Clinton went into patent law to accelerate that process. Because what the British have known for hundreds of years, or more specifically, the livery companies of London have known for hundreds of years, if you control the patent pool, in a given supply chain, you control the supply chain. If you control the supply chain, you control the trade across the supply chain. And I'm paraphrasing Sir Walter Raleigh. If you control the trade across the supply chain, you control the riches of the world. And if you control the riches of the world, you control the world itself. So the inholders war rooms which allow any guest room in any hotel controlled by the inholders to be used as a honeypot to entrap adults in the company of child prostitutes where they're filmed and recorded means that you control the guest room and you control the guest. So when Blowjob Clinton goes to stay at the Starwood Sheraton Hotel in Port Douglas in Queensland on the morning of 911 in the United States. 
his behavior while he's in that guest room at the Sheraton Hotel in Port Douglas, Queensland, would be strongly influenced by what he was watching on the television. And if that television was hooked up to the Serco satellite communication system, Skynet, and the Cisco teleconferencing system, then Blowjob Clinton would have had a real-time view of the deployment of triage teams on the Pentagon lawn before the explosion which killed the duty officer, Captain General de Conto. Or did it? Because if the triage team was deployed on the Pentagon lawn before the explosion, it's highly likely that guests at the Sheraton Pentagon City Hotel sent there by AMIC and Serco and the Sherlock Holmes Park Plaza in London would have been armed with the Special Forces Six Hour type guns so they could go into the US Navy Command Center where AMIC was conducting sabotage vulnerability testing with an unwitting Captain Gerald de Conto, the duty officer. So it would have been very easy to put two bullets in the back of his head and get out of the building and then alert the control tower, which overlooks the helicopter landing pad outside the building, to engage its jamming systems that would disrupt the communication of the US Navy Command Center, and for that matter, the chain of command that terminates with George Bush, who'd been carefully moved out of position to read a goat story in an elementary school. So all of those communications systems were jammed. And apparently, Washington went blind, deaf, and dumb on the morning of 911. Well, of course it did. It was being jammed by the British. Inside the Pentagon was the result of a major contract with Nortel called Voice Internet Protocol. That is to say, the communication system that the United States needed at the Pentagon to respond correctly to the, the scene, as the French call it, the mise-en-scene, the dressing of the crime scene, was actually jammed by Nortel out of Ottawa in a war room 100,000 square feet that was set up by Carlson Wagonlit Travel for Nortel directors to fly around the world. And the budget, I believe, in the start year, which I think was 2000 or 1999, for Nortel for travel that year was $359 million. That's a lot of hooch. And what they were doing was sending Nortel into the hotels or Nortel agents close by the Pentagon to set up the man. So let me put up now what's going to happen at Sochi. Uh, Phil, can you just take over a bit and I'll just I'll look for the excerpt about the Sochi and Cisco over to you. Yeah, sure. Sochi and Cisco. Uh, remind me of that, David, because Sochi, Super Bowl, Satoro, Cisco, and uh, I'm forgetting what circle. Yeah, I uh, I just put up a, a forecast of what my, when my time comes to depart this uh, green earth, my survivors, how I wish to be lying in state for the quake um, or whatever. No, the wake. Sorry, I was thinking about harp, I guess. Um, speaking of harp and quake, I wonder what the Air Force thinks of the photo that I have, which reminds me, anybody coming up to the Plum City Plunge, let's make sure that we have that uh, photo of the U-2 sitting right here in this office. In fact, uh, let's take a look around the office. We have an 1885 Mercedes, which is actually a, uh, 
I forgot the name of that bike. There's, that's a lady's version. Oh, a penny farthing. That's what it's called. Uh, then collection of clothes. There's my pool shooting clothes where I sometimes dress up like Johnson Shaft. Uh, when I take pictures of myself and my handgun and Jack Max Beast. Uh, then, of course, we have a little thing like that fighter pilot book, which has an inscription. We'll have to have that in the office during the Plum City Plunge. Uh, there's a couple of planters down there that say Green Bay on them. Maybe we'll give those to, uh, there's getting to be quite, oh, that's me. There's getting to be quite a contingent of people in Milwaukee. Um, we have a new able danger agent down there of the male variety whose initials, and you can't make this stuff up, are B.O. Not Barack Obama, but close. Very someone. Um, and so I'd say our two most populous locations, three, uh, Texas, Wisconsin, and Arizona right now. But things change. We got people all over the world, literally. We got people all over uh, the United States and Canada. And we, of course, have, I think right now in the chat room, well, let's just go by the locations, the ones that I know about. Alicia, I don't know where you are, uh, but Alicia is a Spanish form of Alice. I'm about to get him or her a ride. I believe it's a him. Uh, he's from Winona, which is just down the river from me. Then we have Bluebeam, no idea. Catama, I know exactly where he and his wife are, but I can't squeal. But I can tell you that they previously have lived in Canada and Korea. Uh, dirty Driveway there is uh, the guy that pretends like he's David Donaway. He's over in London, I think, probably Richmond upon Thames. David Hawkins, we know he's in uh, British Columbia. David uh, V, as in Victor, uh, that's actually not a human. This is, but on his uh, IDs, so he can break into uh, Sochi and do some canine work. It says his name is David Beach. Uh, DC, I do know where she's from, and she has asked me not to mention that, so I won't. Doreen, I believe, is in Massachusetts. Hope I'm right. Ed Reedhead is in Los Angeles Basin somewhere. Uh, I'm in Plum City, as you can clearly see. Ginger Cookies at the Bang Me office in Bangor, Maine. Hope for you. I always get her mixed up. There's, there's at least two hopes. Uh, I'm going to guess this hope is in either Texas or Annapolis. Or some, in fact, I'm gonna, but I think it's somewhere within uh, striking distance of Annapolis. James Kins, Denver. Craig Peterson, originally from Michigan, now in Phoenix. Max Glitch, down south someplace, uh, and I've forgotten, but I, if you held a gun to my head, I'd say Alabama, and I wouldn't be far off. Mensa Max is the Biltmore chief in Arizona. Autopilot is the European hammer. Uh, when things are cool, he's in Trondheim, Norway. When things heat up, he goes up to Hammerfest. If anybody thinks that there's not a hammer fest, take a look at the map of Norway, go all the way up to the north, and you'll see H-A-M-M-E-R-F-E-S-T. Oversight, somewhere in the Ottawa, new player, I think. Uh, S2 Frog, it starts with a B, ends with a Ville, and it's in Oklahoma. Scott Bingo is one of the uh, Milwaukee Mafia. Sherlock Atomic Betty is a bridge watcher and she's on a bridge probably right now between Gatineau and Ottawa. Susan E., hmm, I know the answer to this, and I think it's New Jersey. Swamp Rat is down there at the highest point of elevation in the Florida Panhandle where they get worms to come out of the ground by driving a stake into the ground and then rubbing it and creating a harmonic which uh, hurts the heads if worms have heads. Uh, so that's who north Actually, I think it's west northwest of Austin. Texas Maverick. I'm not sure she's in Texas, but I think so. And that reminds me, somebody's missing today. Oh, no. Somebody's not missing. I skipped over her. Maranatha is also in Texas. So uh, we have a lot of people, and we have more coming all the time. And that's why I think some of you have had difficulty today. I love that picture, by the way, Craig. And it's a uh, uh, picture's worth a thousand words. Uh, and in fact, you're. I love all your images, um, and I like the uh, support I'm getting out of Craig and Tim recently with ideas. Psychopaths, we hit that hammer uh, in Chapter 5 and in Chapter 6. Uh, well, let's just say that one of you guys that contributes a great deal sent me five 
bullet statements about Hillary Clinton, and I just cannot see how she's going to last much longer before either she throws my sister, Christine Marcy, under the bus, or my sister exposes Hillary Clinton uh, and their relation. Having said that, we're all over the place. Denise says, I'm in Michigan. I just don't like the whole world to know exactly where. Well, I'm exactly the opposite. I'm in, I mean, and I'm, I understand, and I understand why you do that, and, but um, maybe some people can understand why I do what I do, which is tell everybody that my back is to the window at 401 Main Street, Palm City, Wisconsin, 54761, and it sits here at the back of that window at 1 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. generally. It's almost 2.30 now, uh, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, as David and I uh, fearlessly, and there's no reason for us to fear, uh, Winston Churchill had that half right. He said the only thing they had to fear is fear itself. The other half was he had a terrible fear of running out of gin. Uh, and there's a comic there, some lady, uh, let's just say Lady Codswalla, uh, that's an English term, and David Beach or uh, David Donaway can tell us what Codswalla means. But uh, one night at a cocktail party, Lady Codswalla told Winston Churchill, Winston, you're drunk. Yes, Lady Codswalla, and you're ugly. But tomorrow morning, I shall be sober, and you will still be ugly. So, David, now that I've uh, kissed your comic rear end because you're a Brit, why don't you tell us something intelligent? Okay, Phil. Well, uh, funny you should word the, use the word intelligent. We've been talking about Cisco. So back in 1981, I was the coordinator of artificial intelligence and geoscience research for Schlumberger in Richfield in Connecticut. And I'd written a paper about virtual reality which the senior scientist uh, said was the most important paper ever written at Schlumberger, which was kind of nice. But we had two consultants, one from Stanford University by the name of Ed Fleigenbaum, and the other by the name of Marvin Minsky from MIT. And they were both advising Schlumberger on new technologies in the world of artificial intelligence. And I looked at both of these guys, and to put it bluntly, they were full of SHIT. Is that the uh, what they were talking about. hotel internet triage you're talking about, Dan? Yeah, that's exactly right. So um, I tried to get my advances adopted by Schlumberger, and there was a very elitist uh, polytechnician who ran the lab. And he refused to adopt any of the breakthroughs that I'd made, so I quit. But essentially, my work was in the field of virtual reality. And I then went ahead and went back to the UK and developed a system for Brit Oil that was runner-up for the British Computer Society Gold Medal Award behind IBM. And we basically pushed back the frontiers of virtual reality and artificial intelligence. Anyway, forget about that. This isn't about hubris. What I didn't realize was that there was a woman who worked for Schlumberg. Her name is Sandra or Sandy Lerner. She was born in 1955, and she was a co-founder of Cisco Systems with then partner Leonard Bosak. And she worked at Schlumberger, and I believe that she looked with her cronies at the work I'd done at Schlumberger Doll Research Center and decided that I was worth tracking. So in the UK, when I assembled my software team and continued to work on this project, I was being shadowed by uh, people who went on to form the network that we're looking at now that has the capacity to generate virtual reality at the Sochi Games and the Super Bowl My Technologies. I can't prove that. I don't think they can disprove it. But I'll tell you what, Field, I'll go into the very jaws of hell to drag them out and bring them to justice if I can demonstrate that that is the case. Because the work that I had done was intended for the good of humanity. And I can still do it, but I'm a little longer in the tooth. So it's 12.33, and it's time for the red button, I think. Over to you. Oh, I don't know. Where do you want to run up to? Do you have some pressing project? Well, um, you normally press the button. I can stay on for a bit, whatever you want to talk about. Well, I'd like to. I don't. You don't have live stream, so you can't see what I'm doing here, can you? No. Okay. 
I would like someone who's got live stream to update David on exactly what I'm doing in the field of view. So David, I'll just be walking around a little bit and hopefully somebody will be able to see me and see what I'm doing and report to you uh, ah, report that. Okay, David, uh, when you see this, in fact, do you ever go look at the live stream video later after the fact, David? Yes or no? No. Okay, well, you're, you better today because I just did something on the camera. Let's see if anybody, um, I've got a lag. Can you, David, what's the last comment that you see on your uh, campfire chat? David, that's a question. Look at your campfire chat. Are it's, you on chat? It, said, it says, well said, David. Ginger, don't look. Field is putting on his skirt. Uh, let's see. Who said that? Okay, look, that's cute. Uh, Craig, so with a hug, do, 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 do. Craig saying goodbye. I guess we have to leave now. Craig saying goodbye. Somebody, Rosebud says the soup's on. Uh, Denise says laugh out loud. And I'm trying to, don't look. Field is putting on his skirt. Ginger, yeah. Field wearing hat and kilt. So stylish. Yeah, and uh, I probably, when uh, the car show comes, then that's on Friday night, July 18th of 2014 at 7 p.m. right here on Main Street. Uh, hopefully, I won't have to drive any of my cars and I can just walk along in my kilt uh, with my tenor saxophone, uh, cutting a wide swath through Plum City and letting the evil parties, uh, like the Clintons, plural, the Obamas, plural, the cameras, plural, Camerons, not cameras, plural. Uh, I think that I'll be the only guy wearing a fur hat and a kilt and a tenor saxophone in Plum City, Wisconsin on Friday night. Uh, and if I'm not, then I'll know that I have a kindred soul somewhere out there. And that was a song that came from the movie E.T. and it was sung by Linda Ronstadt. And so, David, I guess we can leave. I just want to see if people can report to you what we've said. Kilt, yes. Seems to be doing a bonobo romantic gesture. Huh. Well, that's your friend David Donaway who said that. And so, apparently, Brits would know what a bonobo is. Uh, I don't. Excuse me. His Scottish, his, his Scottish kilt. Yes, that's correct. Uh, be careful with that school package. Yeah, that's right. Take good care of uh, Alpha Golf. Oh, good grief. He's not supposed to do that in front of others. Uh, what was it I did, Ginger? Mines. Yeah, Common Core is, and it comes from um, Common Purpose over in the UK, and a really good source for exposing uh, Common Purpose is Brian Garish and Mike Robinson at the UK Column. And if you're interested in following the UK Column, it's a news and uh, video uh, opportunity and you can find them by going to UK column, C -O -L -U -M -N, uh, dot org. Uh, love that hat, Susan E. Okay, well if I ever come to New Jersey, I'll be walking around the Newark airport in this hat and you can you can run screaming if you see me. Super Bowl. So David if you'd like to I'll give you a break in just a split second. A little tricky for me to read. Let's see do 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 do, do. education and state uh, hope it's not drafty on Saturday night. You know, uh, I think you're referring to my my very formal attire, which in case anybody missed it. Oh, I think I got my I got it on sideways. Let me just. I don't know if I should turn my skirt or if I should turn my body. Ah, that's better. Um, okay, David, do you want to say anything about the Super Bowl before we ask Mensa or someone else to put up? I see you just posted something about Las Vegas. Um, Cisco has been selected to provide video or its videotape TV service as delivery platform to NBC Olympics, a division of NBC Sports. Uh, do you want to talk about that before we go, David? I can leave anytime you can. It's cold here and I've got animals to take care of. Yeah, sure. Um, we have Cisco providing a teleconferencing immersive capability to change the look and feel as perceived by the public, of events as they unroll at the Super Bowl on Sunday and at Sochi. In Sochi, 
they're working under contract with the NBC Sports Group. And of course, we must remember that NBC Universal put the film United 93 together, where actors wearing red bandanas take over the plane and the storyboard is constructed by, allegedly by the Sherlock Holmes people in London to support the evidence that was found at the crime scene in Shanksville, Pennsylvania of a knotted red bandana that is perfectly intact, albeit a hundred ton plane has disappeared into half a, a dumpster. So what Cisco has do can literally change public perception of events at Sochi and at the Super Bowl. Now, whether they choose to put on a mass casualty event is almost immaterial. They have the capability of getting people at the crime scene before the legitimate first responders so that evidence can be planted, evidence can be removed, while the story or the wag the dog story is going out through the international media, which does not employ frontline reporters. It employs comely news readers who become automatically script kiddies. That is Jane Stanley reading the script for the news from New York on 911 reads a statement that the Salomon Smith Barney building has come down, notwithstanding it's still up over her left shoulder. That is to say, Jane Stanley is a script kiddie. The fact that she's too terrified to explain why she was duped is very telling. My assumption is that she's been caught up in the Carlson wagon lit travel pedophile honeypots, which probably have 188,000 people working, not all knowledgeably about what's going on, and a very large number of guest rooms at the four star and five star hotels around the world that allows them to put some really influential people near a crime scene to obey totally the script that they're given and never reveal the deeper conspiracy. So just in summary, the problem that they face is their reputation for ruthlessness, efficiency and precision in terms of the number of bodies counts and the number of body bits at a crime scene stands or falls depending on how precise they can be at the next event before it happens. That is to say, if they declare to their insiders, who might need a little bit of encouragement, that on Sunday there will be a bomb under the left-hand side of the press box at the Super Bowl that will kill 57 people with 500 body bits. If they fail to deliver, i.e. the place, the time, the body count and the body bits, they lose their reputation. And who are they surrendering to? Well, they're surrendering to Able Danger because we are the only counterintelligence organization in the world that has uncovered the MO. So if they proceed, the MO is exposed. If they don't proceed, they've surrendered to a, a higher power. So on that note, I'm happy to close, Phil. Over to you. Uh, you've just reminded me of a song by Van Morrison, yeah, okay. This is a wonderful way to close. Van Morrison wrote a song that just, I mean, I don't know when he wrote it. I know he sang it. I think it's probably been 10 or 20 years, uh, more likely 15 to 20. It goes, whenever God shines his light on me, opens up my eyes, uh, and in fact, I'm going to go before we, David, you can go anytime before I go, I'm going to put up the lyrics uh, because Van Morrison is thought of being uh, perhaps a drug abuser, perhaps uh, an alcohol abuser, perhaps a person with confused sexuality. Uh, I don't buy any of those tags. I don't think, I don't think a bad person can write good lyrics. I think uh, good people could write bad lyrics, but I, the reverse, I met her twice. And I have both times I had 
exclusive access to her mind because she was in the cockpit of a Boeing 727 uh, once on the ground in Memphis, once on the ground in Los Angeles. Both times were a delight. Over to you. Uh, you just reminded me of a song by Van Morrison. Yeah, okay. This is a wonderful way to close. Van Morrison wrote a song that just, I mean, I don't know when he wrote it. I know he sang it. I think it's probably been 10 or 20 years, uh, more likely 15 to 20. It goes, whenever God shines his light on me, opens up my eyes. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to go before we, David, you can go anytime before I go, I'm going to put up the lyrics uh, because Van Morrison is thought of being uh, perhaps a drug abuser, perhaps uh, an alcohol abuser, perhaps a person with confused sexuality. Uh, I don't buy any of those tags. I don't think, I don't think a bad person can write good lyrics. I think uh, good people could write bad lyrics, but I the reverse. I met her twice, and I have both times I had uh, exclusive access to her mind because she was in the cockpit of a Boeing 727 uh, once on the ground in Memphis, once on the ground in Los Angeles. Both times were a delight.